that comes through? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us today. It's always like coming home. It's a real pleasure to see friends. We've been connected with this church for 18 years. I 18 think so. Years a long now. time. Yeah. <laughs> and my but I'm still in my 20s like Amy is. <laughs> <laughs> my compliments to the pastor. What a great job. Wow. To the musicians, it's all been great. Yeah, amazing service. <laughs> Woo! I couldn't do what you're all doing. Uh, for those that don't know, we started a missionary retreat between Kyle and Bennett about 18 years ago. Had about 2,000 missionaries come through, and we thought, well, let's go where the missionaries are and try to help. So that's how we wound up in Africa. Amen. We have a video, mercifully, it's very short, <laughs> but it doesn't show everything. It's, it's, it's still too much fun for me. <laughs> it doesn't show the 10 foot black mamba that our dog killed <laughs> in our front yard <laughs> after we moved to get away from snakes. It doesn't so show the car, the ministry car that flipped seven, eight times. Uh, people threatened to shoot our staff. There was a roll, multiple car rollover accident and people were stealing tires off the cars that were upside down. <laughs> so you don't get to see the, oh, the murder victim I found on the adjoining farm. So. There aren't pictures of any of that good stuff. No, but there, <laughs> there needs to be so you get a feel for what it's really like. <laughs> okay, before we, sh oh, I don't need this because I have a headgear. Um, let's see here. We're, we're, technic we're always technically challenged. Okay, before we show our video, I want to talk for just a minute to the youth that are here. Um, one of the things, or a couple of the things that we do in South Africa is we have a hockey team, a field hockey team. And we are so proud. We, we support this team. We bought their equipment. Our staff goes in and does devotions with them every week. Uh, one of the guys on our staff, Alfred, is very, very athletic. He coaches soccer. He leads a sports outreach. And this year, we have a village where we have about 30 teens. The village is very, very remote. And the kids are getting in trouble because they have nothing to do. So we are starting a hockey team, not a hockey team, a soccer team. Now, they don't call it soccer. They call it football. But they're starting that this year because we want to impact teenagers, middle schoolers and high schoolers, to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what? Evangelism takes place everywhere, right? On a sports field, at school, at work, in the grocery store, wherever we are, evangelism should take place. And so we have some T-shirts today on the front. It just has our logo, Strong Cross Ministries. On the back, it says Gapila Soccer. That's where we're starting our new soccer outreach. So if you are in middle school or high school and you're in the service today, we want to invite you to come up and get a T-shirt. Ooh. So come on up. Now listen, we're going to pray for you when you come up, though, okay? Because we want to believe God to use you to impact your world. So if you're in high school or middle school, come on up and we'll give you a t-shirt. Come on, guys. Come on. Woo! This is exciting. And you guys can tell the Chi Alpha people, the missionaries on Sunday morning gave us t-shirts. <laughs> okay, the sizes are all really large. I'm sorry. So you guys are just have to, you know... Go. You guys want red ones? <laughs> They're just all bigger sizes. Sorry. Okay, why don't you guys just kind of gather around in a, in a little circle here? And this is what we want to pray for you. Oh, come on. We got everyone? Okay, this is what we want to pray for you, that God gives you a heart for the lost. And for some of you, that means that God is going to raise you up to do ministry as a vocation. God's going to use you to transform your world. For others of you, God's going to put in you such a desire for the lost that you are going to pray and intercede for people to come know Jesus. For others of you, after you get through college and you're loaded with big bucks, God's going to tell you, send people 
help people, support people. So are you guys ready? Are you ready this morning to be used by God to change your world? Okay, can you just lift your hands with your t-shirt? <laughs> and we're going to pray. You want to pray, Chris, or you want me to? Lord Jesus, I thank you for these youth. I thank you that they're in an amazing church that teaches the word of God, that they're in a church that teaches about winning the lost and supports missions. And Lord, we ask that you anoint them in this season of their life to be soul winners in the name of Jesus. And Father, as they grow and as they mature, Lord, that they would be people who are known to be hungry for the lost, to be moved by people that don't know you, that you would use them to impact their world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Woohoo! Thank you, guys. Come on, we got a powerful army right in your church. Oh, you want to explain? Okay, Chris wants me to explain. Uh, you want to talk, talk about this? This is because from far from my I'm I <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, can we go ahead and show our video? Cross Ministries has been in South Africa for approximately eight years. Our goal is to partner with local churches to make them more effective in ministering in their communities. We do feeding programs, after school programs, we do Bible studies for women, we do events for men that give them the opportunity to connect and to share their hearts about their families. We also work in local schools and sporting events. We do everything that we can to help the people be self-sustaining, to help them be educated and well-fed. The primary goal of Strong Cross Ministries is to help people understand that God loves them and does not count them as their enemies. God will be their protection and provider, not their witch doctors or deceased ancestors. They only need to seek a relationship with God as they would a true father. Our primary goal is spiritual, not humanitarian.
the things that happened this year is we were doing um, vacation Bible school, and one of our staff members asked this group of, I don't know, they're probably first, second graders, hard to remember, what does it mean to be wealthy? And this little girl raises her hand, and she says, you're rich when you have underwear. Okay, now, that's a third world country perspective. We personally believe that all children should have underwear. But um, we had a mission team that came from up in North Glen this year, and they brought underwear for kids. Now, now we, we meet with probably 600, 700 kids a week. It's a lot of underwear. But anyway, we were meeting in this village, uh, village of Macacain, and we feed about 80, 90 children every day, every, every weekday. After school, they come, and, and they're fed. And these are orphans or at-risk children. So they receive a meal because we know when they go home that night, they're not going to be fed. So we took 120 pairs of underwear. You know, we, don't, we want every child to get underwear, and we don't want to run out. Well, we fed the children. We did a service. They were having a great time. And we're getting ready to give out the underwear. And the kids just keep coming. They just keep coming. So now we've got about 160 kids and about 120 pairs of underwear. And so Chris looks at me and just says, just give it out. Now, I personally think that it was just a great spiritual moment. Chris said he just didn't know what to do, and so he just said, give it out. You know, every child got underwear. Come on. Every child got underwear. And every child got the right gender, which we also feel is important. They got the right gender and the right size. And you know what? We even had underwear left over. So God is so good. And we've we've seen it, God, in the past multiply food for children. But but this is the first time it's been something like underwear. So what I want to talk about today are principles of increase. So if you need underwear, this is the message for you. (laughs) You know, God blesses and he increases in our lives. And there are principles that we see in scripture that we can look at and study and grab a hold of and know that God has promised to take care of us as we're obedient to his word. Um. Chris was up in the, the, I don't want to call it foothills, but the the mountains. They're called Waterberg Mountains surrounding where we live. And he'd been distracted. We'd been busy. He got up there and didn't have enough fuel in the car. And you get in those remote areas, there are no gas stations. First of all, over 80% of the people in South Africa don't own cars, so there's no reason to have a gas station in a rural area. So Chris is asking some friends of ours who live in this particular region, hey, do you have any any fuel, any diesel that I can buy from you? And they've got a couple gallons, and they pour it in the, in the, in the car, and Chris says, man, I hope this is enough to, to get me home. And, and Chris just says, you know what? God's going to provide. It's going to be fine. God's going to take care of me. And, and the woman says to her, God only takes care of people when you're not stupid. You should have gotten <laughs> gas. But you know what I want to tell you? God still takes care of us, right? <laughs> Come on, how many of us have made not so great choices or not thought things through and God still takes care of us? Amen? All right, so what I want to look at today, if you have your Bibles, if you'd like to turn to 2 Kings chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7. And this is an amazing story about a woman, a widow, living in an extremely difficult time, but supernaturally experienced the multiplication of God. She supernaturally saw God take what she had, multiply it, and increase it, and to do something amazing. So the scripture reads as follows. A certain woman of the wives of of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons. 
to be his slave. Now that's desperate. That's desperation, right? And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And the maidservant said, I have nothing. I have nothing but a little bit of jar, a little jar of oil. Then Elisha said to her, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her. And she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons shall live on the rest. What an amazing miracle. Wow. God took what little she had and multiplied it. Amazing. Amazing. God takes what we have and he multiplies it. He takes underwear and he multiplies it. He takes money and he multiplies it. He takes what little strength we have at the end of the day and somehow multiplies it to get what needs to be done, done. He does this individually, and he does it in a corporate body. He takes what we have, and he multiplies it. He takes our gifts, our talents, our abilities, and he multiplies. You know, we see so much in South Africa. Um, I think last year we, we talked about the snake bite that happened. Well, when we got back to South Africa this year, one of the first things that happened, I went to ladies' Bible study, and there, tapped on the door of the church building, or the building where we meet, was a dead snake. And I came home and I said to Chris, you have got to be kidding. Chris wasn't there. I'm like, so someone tacked a dead snake up? I got bit by a snake. Seeing a snake dead tapped to the wall is not going to make me afraid. And what I want to say as Christians, the presence of light is more powerful, like we sang this morning, than darkness. And that wherever we go as Christians, the light of God follows us. Darkness has to flee in the presence of God. When we raise up a standard, the enemies have to flee. They have to go. And this poor woman in our story, she looks to the man of God to help her. Elisha ministered in a time when Israel was suffering. And they were suffering because of unrighteousness. They weren't living for God. They weren't focused on God. But there's always a remnant of people in the midst of difficulty nationally or whatever, there's always a remnant of people that serve God. And we have Elisha and then his, his mentor, Elijah, and they've established this school for people who are called to do the work of the ministry, like a church where people go and they learn and they grow and are sent out to do ministry. And this widow, her husband was one of those men. He was I don't know, for the lack of better word, attending Bible school to learn how to be more effective in ministry. And scripture doesn't tell us how he died. Now, the history has an interesting story about him. History says that this man was a man that served in the house of an important person. And that when the times uh, the prophets of God were being killed, they were being murdered, that this man supposedly saved others in ministry by hiding them away 
to the detriment of his own life. Now, it doesn't say that in scripture. History says that. The Israelites believe that. But we don't know how this man died. We just know that he was gone and he left behind a widow and two sons. That's heartbreaking. What is this woman going to do? Troubles had been fallen her. She was a widow. She was needy. She was vulnerable. There weren't relief organizations in that day. There weren't welfare programs. There weren't housing supplements. There, there wasn't anything like that. And her situation was particularly difficult because her creditor was wanting to take her son. Now, we know that her sons were probably too young to work and support the family, but they were old enough to be taken into slavery. She had no guarantee what would happen to her sons. Who would take them? What would they do? How would they be treated? Would she ever see them? So she did the only thing that she knew to do. She cried out to God in the form of going to God's prophet. You know, when we don't know what to do, we cry out to God. When we don't know what decision to make or where to go, the best thing that we can do is cry out to God. She cried out to God. She made an appeal to the man of God, to the appointed spokesman. She didn't keep her need a secret. Right? You know, there are times when just pride gets in the way, right? We get embarrassed that we've gotten ourselves in a big old mess, that we've gotten ourselves in trouble. We get embarrassed maybe that we've made a bad decision and we're living out the consequences of that decision. Or we just get embarrassed that life circumstances have somehow robbed us and taken from us. We're, we're embarrassed that our children are struggling when we've raised them the right way to go. We're embarrassed that we've made a bad investment financially or that whatever the circumstances, and, and we don't want to tell anyone. Well, you know what? Sometimes we just need to tell. Come on, we need to go to someone and say, this is what's happened to me, and I don't know what to do. That's what this woman did. And the Bible tells us that she was a certain woman. She could be any woman. She could be any man. She could be any child. She was a certain woman. And she cries out to Elisha in her time of need. Her pride has disappeared. Her embarrassment is gone. For her future, for the sake of her children, she just needs to be honest and tell someone what is happening. Amen? Amen. Now, I like it that the woman states the facts of her situation, but doesn't get focused on the why. Have you ever gotten stuck on the why? Hey, why did this happen? I've done the right things. Why is it like this? You know, my, my husband was serving God, and, and now he's gone. Why did that happen? He was doing the right thing. We were sacrificing as a family. And and doing everything we knew to do to live rightly. But yet, this tragedy happened. Sometimes when we focus on the why, we miss what God's speaking. Amen? I, I wish there were always reasons to the why. Sometimes there are reasons, and sometimes there just aren't reasons. It's hard to experience increase in blessing if we're stuck on. And I think primarily when we get stuck there, that's all we think about, right? That's all we think about. So if God's speaking and directly, all that gets filtered through, why am I in this situation? And Elisha says to the woman, what shall I do for you? You know, and in times of need, there's only so much that someone can do for us. You know, in South Africa, just because we're American, people just think that, I don't know, that Americans just have a backyard filled with money. Yeah, 
that we got drums buried in our yard with millions, you know? And, and we face a lot of times, I want you to do something for me. I know you're helping other people, but what are you doing for me? Well, sometimes we know this. Sometimes there's only so much. I'm not just talking about money. There's only so many hours in the day, right? There's only so much time that you can be away from your family and still have a good marriage and a good relationship with your children. There's only so much time. There are only so much resources. And it looks like the prophet Elisha says, what shall I do for you? Now, in my mind, why couldn't Elisha just pray and something rain down from heaven? But that wasn't the plan for this woman's increase. Why couldn't Elisha just pray and, and uh, there be pillars of fire that would drive the creditors away? Why didn't that happen? That wasn't God's plan for this woman to experience increase. Someone told me a story. It's been a number of years ago. There was a family, and I, I, I was actually talking to a family member. And within this family, it, it, tragic story, there was a person in the family that was struggling with depression and, and addiction. And this family member murdered someone else in the family. I mean, how, how tragic. And the, the person I was talking to, the woman I was talking to, said to me, you know, the, the pastor came and he prayed and stuff, but he really didn't do that much. And we expected him to be able to, to just somehow fix this and make this all right. Well, you know what? We got to have realistic expectations. What this family was going through was tragic, but there's no way to fix this but the grace of God. There's no way to make this right. There aren't the right words to say. There's no way to, you can speak comfort, you can share scripture, but you can't fix this. Amen? Amen. We have to have realistic expectations on the people that we look to to help us in our time of need. Elisha says to the woman, what do you have in your house? Not, what do I have in my house? What do you have in your house? So this particular situation wasn't about how someone else could help, but it was about the woman helping herself about looking at her own resources, looking what she had, at what she had, sorry, I've got a cold, <laughs> and helping herself, like everyone else here. We all have colds today, it seems like. Uh, you know, Chris and I were, had only been married a few years, and we ended up owing money to the IRS. Anybody been in that place? Oh, my gosh. That, that'll give you nightmares. <laughs> And what we did is we looked, what do we have? I want to say a couple of things, and please don't get mad at me. We didn't look at how much money can we borrow from the bank, because sometimes that's not the answer, right? We didn't look at how much money can we borrow from the bank. We didn't consider, hey, can I, we just call one of our parents and ask for the money. We didn't do that. We didn't think, okay, what are we going to do? Do we get second jobs? You know, we, we, we looked and said, what do we have? For some of us today, God's saying that. You're in crisis or we're in crisis. And we have lack and we have need. And God's saying to you, what do you have that I can give you? You know what Chris and I did? We had a, a friend who, as a wedding gift, he owned an art gallery. He'd given us a piece of artwork. We took it. We sold it. We said, okay, 
So when we're in crisis, I think what do we have is a good question to ask. What do we have? What do we need to change? Right? What can I look at and make different and believe God to provide our resources, to provide for what we need? What do we have? Um, you know, in, in poverty cultures, and it doesn't matter if the culture's in Africa, it doesn't matter if the culture's here or, or in a, in, on another continent, it doesn't matter. But in poverty cultures, People get programmed that they have nothing. So when they're in crisis, it's about someone else giving them something. And you know what? Sometimes that's how God works. But sometimes that's not how God works. Sometimes God is saying to the person in crisis, what do you have? And I think we need to be sensitive to that. Because I remember a number of years ago, a friend going through a difficult time and me thinking, you know what, I, I, I can help. And God's saying to me, step back and pray because I want to do it a different way. I want to do it a different way. So the woman says that all she has is just this little bit of oil. Um. I'm sorry, I just need to say something. Um, this what do I have, or what do you have, it's a personal principle, but it's also a corporate principle. I'm not sure I know how to explain this because I'm not sure I understand it myself. But when you look at your church family, we do this a lot in South Africa. We, we look at a church that we're sponsoring. And there's lack. Maybe there's lack of volunteers. Or maybe there's lack of resources. Or maybe there's lack of something natural. The same principles apply corporately as they do personally. If there's a lack in your church, you need to look at what do we have. What do we have? Okay? You need someone to work in the nursery. What do we have? Who do we have in our church that loves babies? Right? So I'm just saying it's a personal principle and it's a corporate principle. And especially when there's transition in ministry, Chris and I have to do this all the time. You know, we have to look and say, what do we have to get to the next step? The woman has nothing but a jar of oil. And this but, I wish that in Scripture it was all in capitals. Okay, because oil represents the presence of God, the anointing of God, the unity of the spirit. Okay, so this woman is saying, all I have is but a little bit of oil. But oil represents righteousness and beauty and worship. Jesus spent his last evening on the earth in Gethsemane, which means the pressing of oil. It means freshness. It means new wine. It means blessings. It means prosperity. It gives energy. It gives light. Olive trees take a long time to grow and mature, but they last for hundreds of years. There's stability. Oil represented in the Bible, trade and income and, and medicine. Oil was mentioned as a memorial to God, but the woman is saying, all I have is but... Sometimes we do that. All I have is this, but this, just, just a little bit. And Elisha says, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not just gather a few. So she has to go borrow. Her community plays a role in this blessing and in this provision. She has to go to her neighbors. Now, I've been curious. How do you think the neighbors responded? Hey, hey, Kim, you know, all, all the empty vessels that you've got in your house, I want. And you know what? In those days, it wasn't like you went to Walmart and bought those big bags of 
plastic tubs with the clear blue and green lids that cost $4.99 or $6.99. These were earthen vessels. Connie, earthen vessels that hold oil, and she needed earthen vessels. These were pieces of pottery that were handmade. Some of them were probably treasured. Some of them had probably been passed down from generation to generation. But it doesn't appear from scripture that the people she asked were stingy in their giving. They freely gave. Chris and I have this philosophy of ministry or philosophy of life. We never want to treasure something so much that if God asked us to give it away, that we couldn't give it away. Was the widow embarrassed to ask? I don't know. Were people rolling their eyes behind her back? Maybe a few. Were people wondering what she was up to? I'm sure they were. Uh, were people just being sympathetic? Oh my gosh, she just lost her husband. She's lost her marbles. Let's just give her what she wants and have her move on down the road. It may have been all of those things, but she went and asked nonetheless. I'm always curious. The people that she borrowed the vessels from, did they help her carry them to her home? I'd like to think they did. I'd like to think if they didn't understand, they gave anyway. Right? So she brings all of these vessels to her house, and not just a few, but a lot. And then Elisha tells her, go behind the door. Shut your door, you and your son, and begin to pour the oil into the vessels. So she went and she shut the door with just her and her son. Chris and I were having this discussion on the way to church this morning. And we were talking about the difference between privacy and keeping unhealthy secrets. Okay, there's a difference, right? Sometimes we keep secrets that are unhealthy for people involved. And those shouldn't be kept. But sometimes there are things that go on behind a closed door that need to be private. I'm not sure why Elisha told the woman to go behind closed doors and to recruit her sons to help. I don't get it. I don't, I don't really understand that. I mean, did her sons know they were ready to be sold into slavery? I don't know. A number of years ago, a friend of mine, she had a high school daughter, and the daughter was being very promiscuous in high school. And she ended up with a venereal disease. So my friend sends out this email to all of her buddies, me included, about her teenage daughter. That's something that should have been kept behind closed doors. Because every person that got that email, this young woman's life was just exposed to numerous people that should have been kept private. The same things happen corporately. In churches, we don't keep terrible secrets that hide sin. But in natural families and in church families, there are things that are private. There are things where you close the door and the members of that family gather together and experience miracles from God. And that's what this woman and her son had the privilege of doing. Her sons would bring the jar, and she would pour. She'd ask for another jar. They'd bring the jar, and she would pour. She'd ask for another jar. Maybe they had a little assembly line going. I'm not sure. 
Maybe one of them was old enough to actually carry the jar, and maybe someone else had to roll the jar. I don't know. But this was done behind closed doors. And the oil didn't run out until the jars ran out. Amen. I just want to say, every person that shared a vessel with her, whether they did it just because they thought, okay, she's kind of crazy, we're just giving her the vessel, or whether they did it thinking, I don't know what's going on, but man, I want to cheer my friend on. Or whether they gave it thinking, let's just like appease her and send her down the road because we don't have a clue. Every person that gave a vessel is part of a miracle. It's a good reminder to us. If someone asks you to help them, do your best to help. Listen. If a person asks you with unrealistic expectations, you may not be able to. But help a little bit. Help a little bit. You know, there was a season where Chris and I just didn't have a lot. Come on, we've all been there, right? We've all been there. And there were several missionaries that Chris wanted to support. So Chris says, let's just send them $10. Now, this is embarrassing for me to say. But I said, no. If we can't send them a nice gift, I don't want to send them $10. They'll know we don't have a lot of money. They'll wonder, $10? What is $10? you know what, if I had it to do all over again, I'm in a different world spiritually. If I only had a dollar, I would give the dollar. If I only had five dollars, I would give the five dollars. Some people had numerous vessels to give. Some probably only had one. Was the sacrifice of the numerous vessels any greater than the sacrifice of the one? No. It's not about amount. It's about obedience. Someone asks you for $100, and you don't have $100, or you're not led by God to give $100, give them a dollar. There's enough people in the faith community that give a dollar, it becomes a hundred dollars. That's what happened. Those people were part of the miracle. You know, I want to be a part of a miracle anytime I can be part of a miracle. Amen? Amen. So the woman goes back to Elisha and says, now what do I do? Now what do I do? My house is filled with all of these random vessels of oil. The, the oil's gone. The vessels are gone. Now what do I do? And Elisha says, go and sell the oil. You pay your debt. You save your sons. And you have enough to live. God multiplies. Um, I just want to ask a couple questions and then the prayer team is going to come and they're going to pray. This has been an amazing service today. An amazing service. What a great praise and worship. Oh my goodness. So refreshing. I know it's refreshing for me and I know it's refreshing for Chris. We're in worship services where we don't have a clue what they're saying. <laughs> Sometimes we're singing lyrics because we just have learned them in study, but we don't even know what they mean. <laughs> it's, it's nice to be somewhere where the temperature is comfortable. It's nice to be somewhere where things aren't falling on the tin roof and you're wondering what the heck's going on outside. 
It's nice to be with people that's good. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's been an amazing service. And I just want to ask you today, where do you need increase in your life? Where? Is it money? That's a big thing, right? Is it faith? Is it some kind of resource? Maybe that's family problem? Are you worried about your kids? Think about this widow. Her children are being sold into slavery. For some of you, you feel like your children are slaves to sin. Where do you need And then the next question is, what Not what can someone else give you, although that's a part of it. But what do you have? You have a little bit of strength at the end of the day to pray and you need to pray. You have a little in the checkbook that you need to cover your expenses. Corporately, what does this church have to grow and to increase? I can tell you a few things that this church has from my observation. We have great leadership. have a great pastor. You have friendly people. You have people that love you and share you. You have an amazing worship team. You have a beautiful building. When people drive up, it's warm, welcoming. You have children. I saw this little girl on the end. I, I think she belonged to. Oh, okay. She had her groove on. <laughs> you have children who somewhere along the line have been taught to worship God. They've been taught. You have all of this youth. Oh, my goodness. How fun. You have prayer team. You have leaders. You have volunteers. You have church offices. You have stability. You have a great reputation. You know that we talk about you guys? We do. We talk about you in Africa. We talk about the church that sent us out and how when we're coming back to America, we're going to visit and, and they're going to celebrate with us. You have a lot, and God's going to increase what you have individually and as a church. So I'd like to just invite the prayer team to come. And I want to address the congregation. If you're needing increase, come today and let these people pray for you and believe with you. If you need help figuring out what you have, let them come and agree with you in prayer. Amen? And also, this is a great family. If you're facing other needs in your life today, please pray with you. They want to love on you. They're not going to judge you. They're not going to criticize you. They're going to have compassion and mercy and agree with you. Uh, before church, uh, when we were doing praise and worship and singing that song about um, the name of Jesus and the light um, overcoming the darkness, I was thinking about Dusty's favorite parable, which was about, I think, the woman who reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' garment. After this, and, you know, he's on his way to heal the, the daughter, or he's, and the centurion says, just speak the word, 
And in both of those cases, um, Jesus said, no greater faith have I seen. And I thought, it's just the faith of a mustard seed that we need. It's just the faith of a mustard seed, which is so small. So if you think that you have the faith of a mustard seed to pray for what Tanya is talking about, the increase that you need, I'm begging you today to come up because we will believe with you and your increase will grow. Your mustard seed faith will grow. So I'm just encouraging you, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, and I thought, she was healed from a deadly snake. And I was sitting there today praying, God, I got a doctor's report the other day that said, my arm, I've been having arm problems. And he said it could take up to a year. And I said, no way, buddy. I am not, I'm not gonna receive that. I bu I'm gonna believe this morning, is what I was standing there thinking, I'm gonna believe this morning that God is gonna heal my arm. I got a trip to Africa, and I am not gonna have an arm that's not working. And I thought, Tim has been healed. There are people in here that need physical healing. So Lindsay, I know that you need healing. So I'm just saying, if you have the grain of mustard seed faith, please come up and pray. My favorite part of that story is when he says, get some vessels, not just a few. Let's pray to God like we're praying to God for crying out loud. Right? Let's not expect a little from God. Come on. So as Paul's playing, um, let's, let's pray for you guys, man. Let's see what happens.
You know, sometimes I think uh, we get this idea, you know, and I'm not saying it's not true, that, that you can sit where you're at, you can pray, God might do something, God can do something, right? But I think when you do that, that's kind of like bringing a few vessels. Does that make sense? I think when you take that step and you're bold and you say, look, I'm, I'm going I'm to go, I'm going to ask for prayer, I'm going to ask for help. I think that's when you start gathering up those other vessels, I think. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to dismiss here pretty soon. If you still need prayer, we're not, we're not um, telling you we don't have time, anything like that. We'll stay all day. I tell you that every Sunday. Test me one day. I'll stay here all day and pray with you if you need it. But um, right now, we don't want to miss the opportunity to bring Chris and Tanya up here. Um, any board members that we have in the room, um, church leadership. But anybody, anybody who just feels like praying with Chris and Tanya, I mean, we're part of a big family, but this is legit family right here, right? So we want to pray with them um, the way a family should pray together. So we just want to invite anybody who would like to come up here. And then uh, I want to remind you one more time, there'll be a couple people in the back. If you'd like to drop a little uh, love offering in there for, for the blessings, um, Randall Williams was the one that said, he had faith that there would be blessings in church this morning. You know, he's using the pun, but I believe it, you know. So we're going to pray for Chris and Tanya. Man, just hang out with them for a few minutes before you leave. Let them tell you more stories and, and just hear about God moving. We talked about that last week, that the, the gospel is on the move in the world, guys. And they, they will tell you stories that prove it, okay? So we're going to pray for them right now. Lord God, we just thank you again for... Chris and Tanya, blessing, Lord. We thank you for the heart that you've given them for the lost, Lord. We thank you that they are um, obedient to that, Lord, that they are sensitive to that. God, I, I believe that you give that to all of us, but sometimes we're just not sensitive to it. Lord, we, we thank you that Chris and Tanya are sensitive to the heart that you've given them for lost people. Lord, we pray that as they're in Africa doing work, God, that you would give them fresh, new ideas that nobody's done yet. God, that we wouldn't, um, you know, forget to ask you for, for new and fresh ideas, Lord. And we pray that you would just begin to pour those out in the hearts of Chris and Tanya. New, fresh ideas that nobody has ever tried that's going to be successful in sharing the gospel with the people of Africa. Lord, we pray that as they go and they do the work that you've called them to do, Lord, that every single thing that they put their hand forward to do will prosper. God, as you've given them vision and, and revelation of what your will is for them to do. Lord, we pray that people will see their example, God, and they will rise up inspired to do what they are doing, Lord, that there will be new generations of missionaries and new generations of people supporting missionaries just because of the inspiration of people doing what you've called them to do. Oh God, we pray for blessings for them. God, that 2019 would be a year of blessings, a year of rejuvenation, new love for what they do. God, that they won't get tired of it. They won't get frustrated, Lord, that, that there will just be evidence of your hand moving in their ministry constantly throughout this year, where there will be new excitement for what you have for them. God, as you give them new ideas and you bless their ministry, in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. You are all welcome to stay and have us pray with you if you need it. You're dismissed if you need to go. We love you guys. Thank you guys for coming. Hope to see you all next week.